we're here. Let me go live on TikTok as well. I'm gonna give you guys like two minutes and then we're starting because we have a lot of slides. We have 77 slides and multiple slides are slideshows and videos. We're gonna be here for a fucking while. So buckle in, we're talking about Fire Festival. Oh, I'm so happy I'm here. I've been so fucking stressed out and anxious. I'm moving in a week. My camera's a little crooked, but it's very unstable, so I am afraid to touch it. Um, I'm moving in a week, and I'm just like, I just want to die. Like, it's just so fucking stressful. Um, but how's, how's the audio visual? Can we hear me? Can we see me? How are we doing? My computer was acting a little funky when I first logged on. Good. As a former event planner, I cannot wait for this one. Oh, you're going to love this. You're going to love this. Maria Fernanda, 1536, thank you for subscribing with Prime. I'm going to turn my light down a little bit. You're probably looking at my armpit, which is fine, but I just wanted, I want to feel a little cozier with you guys. Okay, I'm very excited. Um, and I just decided what we're going to do next week. Also, because I know sometimes people don't stay until the end, just a heads up, like next week, like this upcoming week, stream is going to be on Tuesday instead of Wednesday because the movers are coming on Wednesday and I'm just not sure what time I'll get out of here. So I was like, I'd rather just do it a day early where I know that I'll be home as opposed to trying to do it at my hotel and then like if I'm running late and I just like want to focus when the movers are here. So I'm just going to do it on Tuesday instead. Um, so today we're talking about the fire festival. So let's go ahead and get started because I told you I was going to give you two minutes and it's been two minutes because we have a lot to fucking talk about today. But first we have my mini Dr. Pepper pipeline complete. Batty Bailey. Thank you. The pipeline is where you go from TikTok to YouTube to Twitch. Some people go straight from TikTok to Twitch, but all right, let's open the Dr. Pepper here. I'll hold it to you close so you can hear it. It's a very ASMR moment for you. Um, spoilers in a box. Thank you for gifting some subscriptions. Sleeveland McDeagle? I don't know. That sounds like a slur. Um, thank you for subscribing. Are you talking about the submarine? I'm not. It's like fighting all of my urges to not talk about the summary submarine. But today, um, Fraz and I recorded an episode for our Patreon where we do talk about the submarine. That's all we talk about for a full hour. So that'll be coming out. I don't know when that'll be coming out, but you can subscribe to my Patreon if you want to hear me talking about the submarine because it's just, it's so fucking much. I just, we can't even get into it. I'm going to stop talking about it right now because if I start talking about it, I'm not going to be able to stop and I have so much I want to say and I just can't fucking talk about it. My car just broke down, so I really didn't need this. Okay, let's get into it then. I have my Dr. Pepper. Mm, so fucking good. So fucking good. All I've eaten today is McDonald's. Not in like an eating disorder. I've had one meal today, just in like a, I've gotten McDonald's twice today. But it's not my fault because I was really craving the breakfast. So I got the breakfast and then it wasn't good. So I didn't eat all of it. And then I was out running my little errands and I was like, whoa, I feel like shit right now. And I realized because I didn't really eat breakfast. I ate like half a breakfast. And so then I like had to eat food and the only thing around me was McDonald's. Lorecat69, thank you for subscribing. And I should also say, thank you, Emily, who just gifted me $5. If you have not noticed, there is another addition to your screen. It's a little banner down here. Um, I am trying to get a new computer so that I can make better streams. And I have floated through a variety of ways to collect money. And it appears that the easiest for everyone is Venmo. So if you do not have Venmo, I'm so sorry, but keep your money. Thank you for trying. Um, and if you do have Venmo, feel free to scan right there and Venmo me or my Venmo username is at redacted underscore parking lot. A um, dollar, 50 cents, $20. I've gotten things all across the board. All of it is going into a separate bank account. And then once I reach my goal, that it will be used to buy a new computer. Um, so thank you. So that you might be like redacted. Where did you get that number? 1,857 that I so my really close friend used to be an Apple genius. So we sat down together because I'm a Mac person. And we looked at all the Mac stuff. And he kind of looked at what I'm using now. And we figured out what everything I'll need to get set up. So that's the computer, the keyboard, the little trackpad, like that's everything all in. That's why it's a very oddly specific number and tax too. So 
That's where I landed at that number. Before I started tonight, I will have raised $153. Unfortunately, that graphic does not update by itself. I'm the one updating that. So to see an updated number, join next week and you'll see the updated number every week. And then I'm going to make that little circle. Hopefully it'll get whole one day. So that's what's going on on that little under screen. But now that I have said, let's get started a million times, let's actually get started. And it's only five minutes in. That's pretty good for us. So today, oh my, my phone is blowing up with the Venmos. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Oh, we love to hear it, love to see it. Okay, so let's talk about Fire Festival. So, if you have no idea what Fire Festival is, if you have no idea anything about anything, Fire Festival, spoiler, um, was a fraudulent music festival founded by Billy McFarlane and Ja Rule. It was created with the intent of promoting the company's app for booking musical talent. It was scheduled to take place on two separate weekends, April and May in 2017, um, in the Bahamas. The event was promoted on Instagram heavily by people like Kendall Jenner, Bella Hadid, Haley Baldwin, Emily. Ratajowski, M. Rata, we'll call her, um, many of whom did not disclose that they had been paid to do so. So I need to put my phone on Do Not Disturb and I need to plug it in because y'all are like blowing me up with money, which is dope as hell. Um, oh no. You can probably see my ass. I don't like that. My phone charger is stuck in my chair. I rolled over it. You know when that happens? Okay. Oh, and if you do Venmo me, um, please include the word gift. If you did not, it's totally fine. But if you haven't, please include the word gift. So that if the IRS is like, misreacted, what is all this money for? How did you make this? I can just be like, it was a gift to me, which it is. So that's not illegal. Hopefully. <laughs> okay. Oh, the sad ball pit of, oh, of TumblrCon? God. Okay, so let's talk about the details of the lovely Fire Festival. So the festival was organized by these two gentlemen right here, Billy McFarlane and Ja Rule. Billy McFarlane was much more involved in the planning than Ja Rule. Ja Rule, if you don't know who Ja Rule is, he's a rapper. Are you going to get Micah thrown when you move? That is a good question. I'm not sure how I'm going to set my new office up. So he will have a spot, but I'm not sure what it will be. This beanbag is not coming, though, so it'll be a new spot. Um, so who is a Billy McFarlane? He was born in 1991. He was born in New Jersey and his parents are real estate developers. Real estate developers, you say? We all know my thoughts about real estate. We all know my thoughts about real estate. So, um, McFarland told the New York Post that at age 13, he founded an online outsourcing startup that matched clients with web designers. He graduated from Pringy School in 2010. He then attended Bucknell University, where he dropped out May of his freshman year. So, clearly a very, very stellar resume of sorts. Also, for those of you on TikTok, I cannot even see the chat right now. So if you want to like be in the chat and see the slides and all that stuff, you need to come over to Twitch. Thanks so much. Peace and love you. So the son of real estate developers. Um, let's talk about his pre-fire festival career. So his entrepreneurial ideas started early. He dropped out of college to start his first text to, to start his first startup, Spling. TechCrunch described Spling as a content sharing network, criticizing its similarity to other services which existed at that time. I could not find any more information on Spling. I have no idea what the fuck this is, but apparently it's a website to share content. So Pinterest, I don't fucking know. Um, Magnesis sounds like maggots to me. Stop. So after that failed, he tried a new venture, Magnesis. He wanted to improve the regular plastic credit cards him and his friends were using around Manhattan by transferring his card strip onto a sheet of metal. So as a normal person without lots of money, I don't know what this means, but I was about to hold up my debit card. Why am I the dumbest person on earth? So you know how when you have your like credit card or your debit card, it's plastic and it's like a literal hunk of plastic. If you are a rich person with access to cool rich person stuff, a lot of times you get fancy credit cards, like certain American Express cards, and they're a hunk of metal. And it's like very much luxurious and like very much fancier. So he was like, I want the fancy card without being fancy, was his whole shtick. That was the whole thing. Um, he created a makeshift version of the American Express black card, black card, which was the prototype for Magnesis. So literally all it is, is he's putting your 
credit card numbers on a different card. So it's not, a, it's not a credit card company. Like it would be your Visa credit card on a piece of metal. Like he's not providing a financial service in any way. This is, I cannot reiterate how much this is not a credit card company. Um, the, he's the OG for chasing cloud. A heavy card doesn't make you important. He made a metal phone case, but for your credit card, but it's like, it's not a case like they, so the little black magnetic strip on your card that like when you swipe it or the chip, like that's how it knows it's you. He basically just takes that out and puts it onto a new card. So it's like a, like a copy. It's like a copy of your card on better material. So the company launched March, 2014 as a black card for 20 somethings, but like the black card already exists. It already exists. Um, it was also meant to get members into exclusive things like the Magnesis Townhouse in Soho, private parties and discounts on luxury and designer items, and membership costs $250 annually. Um, and it was also supposed to include a car and a driver and a 24-7 concierge to assist users in getting tickets to big events. What the fuck? Like, who? Sorry. People are talking about the submarine. Who would think that $250 a year can get you a car and a driver in New York City? Are you on, like, I have paid $250 in New York for an Uber to the airport. You think that per year is going to get you a car? Like, I don't feel bad for anyone that's given this man money. I'm sorry. I really don't. Um, plus, the American Express Black Card requires an income of $250,000 a year, where Magnesis does it, and it was marketed as a status tool for wealthy millennials. But a former employee says that it was for those wanting to join an out-of-college frat. So it's basically just like a club of some guys with matching cards, but they actually are all different cards, and allegedly they can get tickets to events, but I don't even think that's a thing. Wags00, zero zero, thank you for subscribing. What a read. That's what it is. Um, so here is some coverage of the Magnesis card. This is from August 20th, 2014. And for those of you on TikTok, you have to come to Twitch to see the videos. What is Magnesis? It's, it's a card. It's, it's a card. more than that. It's a card. It's more than that. It was let's take it back to where it all started. Okay. So I'm a technology entrepreneur, but I thought... I'm a technology entrepreneur. No, you're literally not. You're a college dropout, but so I digress. I'm interested in payment tools and credit cards. And I was at dinner with 10 or 15 other entrepreneurs. We all pull out our random debit and credit cards to split the bill. And they see this hodgepodge, these blue Chase cards, these Red Bank of America cards. And I asked everybody how they chose their bank and how they chose their credit card. And every single person said they picked their bank based on location of their first apartment in New York City. I said, this is 2014. That makes no sense. Everything is technology-based. Why are you picking your bank or your financial institution based on its brick-and-mortar location? So I mean, I kind of do understand picking a bank based on where it is. Like, I use Wells Fargo. They're fucking awful. But the reason I use them is because I used to travel internationally a lot, and they have really easily available international customer service. Like... I feel like everyone has a different thing for why they want the bank they do. Take a further look at all the services and realize that all these financial services, particularly those based around credit and debit cards, have really Abby reads, that is a read. Really he does look like you asked markets. AI to generate a so dumb rich white boy. So we saw that as a huge opportunity to build this product that actually affects and enhances and really improves your everyday life in the city. All right, so Magnus is as a card. It connects you to all of these exclusive events, and then the card itself is linked to your own credit card, whatever it is. Exactly. So it's a community-oriented payment tool. It's a community-oriented payment tool. He's to just saying words. Lifestyle services and brands across the city. Okay, so what would be one access that you can describe to people that you get with Magnus? So unlike traditional credit cards that focus on these one-off perks like travel, flights, hotels, or more about things that you want to use every single day. This is so dumb. Clothing stores, car services, restaurants, nightclubs, and things local to New York City. And how much does it cost? So the card is $250 a year. There's an application to get it, but unlike a traditional credit card, it's not credit score based. It's all community based. And really just it's all community based is code for we don't give it to ugly people. And for interesting people across all industries. So a diverse, interesting group from the financial, technology, entertainment, finance sectors. Like... What the fuck are you talking about? It's li he's literally talking about nothing. So here is some pics from the Magnesis era. So again, I think a big part of the draw is this townhouse. Like they all just kind of vibe here and hang out. So this is like 
This reminds me of my sister so much because this is the time that she was in college and I was like living in a small town and I would, and she went to college like in a major city. So I would like be on Facebook looking at her pics and I was like, fuck this bitch having the time of her life. Like the filters, the outfits, like all of this is my sister in college. It's very millennial core. Um, did he think you have to be hot to get a card? Also, probably only white people. Yes, I am sure only white people, but also I feel like only white people having the magnesis card is kind of a chicken and egg thing because I can't envision a person of color getting duped like that. Like I can't, like I, like they would ask more questions and realize that this is stupid. Like this is something that dumb white 19, 20 year olds would buy. You know what I mean? So I'm sure he's racist, and I'm sure that when he says community-based, that's part of what he means. But I also don't think there are that many applications, is what I'm saying. Um, so here's some more pics of the townhouse. Like, it, it, they are literally just paying for friends. Like, you're just paying for friends and to hang out. Here's a pic of the outside of the house. Sorry, it's so blurry. This is from Yelp. Um... Again, this would be expensive. This is in Soho. That's very expensive. This is the most horrifying picture I've seen in my entire life. It's him laying on some millennial women on this weird, like, hotel lobby couch. And they're all holding their magnesis cards, except for the girl all the way to the left. <laughs> um, here's some more pics of the townhouse. So I guess it was kind of like a, like a WeWork situation. Like, you could just kind of go here and hang out. I don't really understand how this works. Um, but here's that table from the other picture. Here's some more pics of the townhouse. Here's that couch. Like you can see it's literally just like a fancy house, I guess. So why didn't it work? Um, fire fraud includes interviews with journalists who covered Magnesis and the former company's employees and more than one person likened Magnesis to madcap NBC sitcoms about ineffective workplaces. Um, and one guy was saying when Billy and Grant got connected, it was like the office, except no redeeming qualities. When I think about Magnesis, I think about Entertainment 720. There's no actual business. It's just guys being in business. So if you do not know what Entertainment 720 is, I just could not resist including this clip. Parks and Rec is probably my favorite show if I had to pick. But I'm just going to show you, this is Entertainment 720. This is basically what Magnesis was. Well, okay, if you want this company to survive, you immediately need to downsize. I mean, you don't need this airplane hanger. Well, I think we do. And two, you have to keep detailed financial records. Thank you. I'm going to try to tell them that. Waste of time. I wouldn't know an unemployed tax reportable expenditure request if it bit him in the ass. Hey guys, which two people here started their own company? Because I'm pretty sure it wasn't you two bosos. Okay, so that's the vibes of Magnesis. Sorry that I just made you watch that entire thing, but I just really liked it. And it probably is going to fuck up the copyright of this video. But, you know, it was worth it. Hashtag no regrets. But anyway, it's basically Entertainment 720. To be more specific, though, the company promised to get exclusive tickets to things like Beyonce and Jay-Z concerts or Hamilton. However, it usually did not follow through with the actual tickets. Events were often canceled last minute, and the number of actual members was very unclear, despite McFarland's claims that membership was growing. According to a Bloomberg report on Magnesis, with, a numerous, with numerous customer complaints and conflicting membership stats, it was increasingly difficult to measure the company's actual success. The company was initially based out of a rented townhouse in the West Village in Manhattan, and then the owner of that townhouse filed a lawsuit against McFarland in 2015, claiming that he had trashed the building, which he denied. The case was settled in 2016, and then they relocated into Chelsea, which is a different neighborhood in Manhattan. Sorry, I keep burping. It's a Dr. Pepper. By 2016, it was operating in New York City and Chicago, and according to McFarland, its membership had grown to tens of thousands. After McFarland's Fire Festival, it ended in a high-profile disaster in 2017. Magnesis reportedly terminated its lease on the Chelsea office, and the website ceased allowing new customers to sign up, and the company has retroactively been described as a scam. So that was his first business venture, was Magnesis, basically Entertainment 720. So when did he get connected with Ja Rule? He got connected with Ja Rule in 2015. They met when he was attempting to book him for an event. Um, the story which McFarland told at a web summit in November 2016 is that he had to go through numerous people to get in touch with the rapper and was like, this guy wanted $500 and I gave it to him. And then he said, oh, my friend needs $1,000. And it was just like 
a super complicated process to actually get to Ja Rule and then like a lot of people that didn't even know him were collecting money along the way. Um, but apparently once he did get in touch with him, Minds connected and he made Ja Rule a celebrity ambassador of Magnesis and he touted that on Fox News in May 2015 and they bonded over their love of flying small airplanes and hip hop. My ex would have fallen for this. One time he asked me if he could mobile deposit cash, which I wish I was joking. That is horrifying, but also I've had that idea. Like, well, they should figure out a way to mobile deposit cash. And then it's just like, maybe your camera burns it afterwards. I don't know. Um, and it should be noted that Emily Boehm, a former employee for Magnesis, who was featured in the Hulu documentary, said that Ja Rule had nothing to do with the business side of Magnesis. So I guess we've got to protect Ja Rule a little bit. So... The dawn of fire media. Because Ja Rule and Billy McFarlane had that experience of like Billy trying to book Ja Rule and it being a shit show, they were like, we should make an app where you can book artists directly through the app. So the artists can approve or deny booking and set their own fees and all of that. So it's like Uber for booking talent. So if you're like, I want Shakira to perform at my bat mitzvah, like you can book her through an app rather than having to go through like all the talent people. Um, this is where the Fire Festival was born. McFarlane and his team wanted a way to promote the app by throwing a music festival. It always goes back to the app. Um, so Ja Rule and Billy deciding that planning a huge event, event, which they have no experience doing, is a good marketing strategy. And the thing is, it could have been a good idea. Like, to have a music festival, this is like... I see the vision because I understand like what they're trying to do. They're like, okay, if we have a music festival and we can promote it, what they should have done is been like, we should get the most hard to book people possible for this music festival. Like people that have not performed together in years. And I would have gotten like a ton of random artists. Like I would not have had consistency with the music style or anything. I would have just gotten tons of artists that have not performed in decades and bands that have not performed together. I don't know how I would pay them, but that's what I would do. Because then you would get people with like a big variety of interests to show up rather than like just one kind of group of people like young millennials if you're only playing like that type of music. You know what I mean? So I would have gotten all of those people and then like really been it and done it in the US. Like it wouldn't have been a travel thing and you would have been able to buy tickets for just like one or two specific shows or day passes or whatever. And then been like, oh, it's to promote the app. Do you want to book talent? And then it's kind of like, oh, we got these really hard to find people. So clearly we know the fuck what we're doing. So like, I get the idea, but even the way they did it, it could have been better. Like, even if it was their full vision, my idea is still better. So they were apparently have this idea to do a music festival. Like we said, they like both like small planes. So they're doing their little man thing. They're on a flight to the Bahamas and they touch down on a lightly populated island, which they later discovered was Norman's K, the former private island of Carlos Lira Rivas, a kingpin of the Medellin cartel. Norman's K is a small island, a few hundred acres to the northern end, northern end of the Exuma chain in the Bahamas. McFarland then leased the island from its current owners, and the owners gave a very strict condition that McFarland make no reference to Pablo Escobar in any marketing materials, because they were like, this is what this island's known for, we're trying to rebrand, like we want it to be known for different things, so you cannot fucking say that. Partially because Pablo Escobar wasn't even really there, it was Carlos Rivas, who was a different guy, but like, an important guy, but not Pablo Escobar, you know what I'm saying? Um, so... First sign of trouble hits early 2016. This is when they started like they started scouting festival or oh, why can't I talk? They started kind of working on the location side of things and they met Delroy Jackson. He is also in the Hulu doc. Um, in the film, Jackson said that he told McFarlane at the outset that the festival was not going to be possible in the area he was looking at because when they were looking at Norman's K, he was like, my brother in Christ, there's no power, there's no water, there's no cell phone towers, like you like it's nothing here like you, you there's quite literally nothing so like this would take years and years so it's maybe not the best spot for this but McFarland was like yeah whatever like I think that that's fine I'm just gonna keep leaning with it and rocking with it and so he just moved forward so they have this island that they know is going to be terrible because a local told them that, but they're doing it anyway. Um, and then it's time for them to do their marketing strategy. They're like, how the fuck are we going to get people to show up to this? So fuck Jerry. You might be familiar with them on Instagram. One time they paid me $50 to post a screenshot of my tweet on their like beige account worth $50. Most people just posted it. Um, 
they neither learned nor rocked with it. Um, so fuck Jerry is the Instagram name of Elliot Tebble, Tebley, Tebley, Elliot, um, came up with the name while watching Seinfeld. He explained to Forbes that he, when he joined Instagram, I would post a comedic post here and there and notice engagement was much higher. And so it slowly fledged into a full fledged, slowly evolved into a full fledged comedy account. Fuck Jerry was one of the only meme accounts of the time. And the account started to go viral from all of the engagement. So in 2016, Jerry media, which fuck Jerry, he then created Jerry media scored a dream contract and the promise of $200,000 to run the social media for the fire festival that's what a lot of instagram influencers do is they also do social media management for like people you wouldn't really think of like brands and stuff like a lot of people don't know sarah shower used to run the social media for denny's so when you see really funny denny's tweets that's sarah shower so that's a really common so i don't think it's weird at all that they hired them to do this that's a very common thing to do i was going to try and do that but then I thought about like, I would want to post things that are like actually funny and then companies would be like, no, that's not okay. And like, get over it. You know, I finally made it to a live stream, even though I'm on the gym at the gym on a treadmill, that's kind of the first or the best place to do this is at the gym. Um, so anyway, did you do, where was I? So they get paid $200,000 or are supposed to get paid $200,000 to run the social media for Fire Festival, a lavish music bash held in the Bahamas um, by Billy McFarlane and rapper Ja Rule. Imagine getting in on the ground floor of Coachella. That's how we were envisioning it. So to make a splash, um, Jerry Media, who was being led by Oren Axe, helped coordinate supermodel influencers like Kendall Jenner, Hailey Bieber, and Emrata, and others to simultaneously pitch the event by posting a simple orange square with the hashtag Fire Festival, and it reached more than 300 million people. Such good marketing. I'm into marketing, and I just like love the way they marketed this. <laughs> as terrible as it was, incredible marketing campaign, very effective. So here's the Orange Square Fire Fest. I'm sure we all remember this. Oh my god, everyone's on the treadmill at the YMCA. That's amazing. So as part of their plan to leverage it, all of these little Instagram models were flown down to the islands to give feedback for the launch, according to an Elle magazine article from the time. Um, the ticket buyers could look forward to yoga on the beach, water trampolining, sea bobbing, music, art, food, and $1 million of real treasure and jewels hidden around the island, which I, why would anyone believe that? Um, in December, a gaggle of supermodels and influencers started posting lavish Instagrams from what seemed to be the same Bahamas trip, but because they tagged many of the images with Fire Festival, people quickly caught on to the trip being a viral marketing tactic. Sea bobbing, it's like these little underwater, I don't know how to describe it, it's like a little thing and it has like an engine and you hold on to it and you can go like and around and it kind of feels like you're a dolphin. It's really fun. Um, so as all this is going on, they're also pitching to investors. Here is the pitch deck for Fire Festival. It was leaked, but I just kind of wanted you to see. Actually, before we look at this, let's I'm going to come back to this. Let's look at more of the trip and then we'll look at the investor pitch. So here's what we were just talking about with the trip that they're on. So even though it's not blatantly an ad, it kind of is an ad because they're all on this trip together. They're posting, they're tagging Firefest, the Firefest account. And then Kendall Jenner apparently received $250,000 for this one Instagram post and she said, "So hyped to announce my good music family as first headliners for Firefest." Get ticks now, firefestival.com. VIP access for my followers. Use promo K John Fire for the next 24 hours to get a list of the artist and talent after party on Fire Pay. Whatever the fuck that means. And Big Sean commented this emoji. Um, so here is the video announcing Fire Festival. This came out January 12th, 2017. The actual experience exceeds all And remember, remember how we said that when they leased the island, the owners specifically said, you cannot talk about Pablo Escobar in any marketing materials. Keep that in mind. Things, and there's something that's
on a remote private island. Yachts, jet skis, the best in food, art, music, and adventure. Once owned by Pablo Escobar. There it is. It's a good ad. They did a good job. Like, I'm saying the Fuck Jerry team, they did great. They told him one thing that he couldn't say. To push beyond those boundaries. Join us. Tickets on sale now. So this is what they're showing to the world in their advertising. Um, let me see when we want to go back to that thing. Okay, so that's what they're showing to like the fuck? That's what they're showing to like the internet and trying to sell tickets and all of that. This is what they're showing to investors. So um, simultaneously, they're selling tickets and trying to get investors to invest money into the festival. So because obviously you have to like pay for all this shit. Um, so we're not going to look through this whole thing, but here's some of their investor stuff. Fire defines how we engage audiences, consume media, and share content by connecting consumers, celebrities, and brands through live experiences. Because remember, this is kind of like for the app as well as the actual festival. So here's Fire Bookings, the problem. So you can see it's a pitch deck. Here's more about the festival. It's really just like a business version of the video we just watched. So here's that video. You can click on it and view it. Fire, 40,000 guests, headliners, good music, major laser. They have not paid any of these people. Um, fire starters, that's what they called influencers. So you can see these are all the people that they're partnering with. Haley Baldwin, uh, Jen Setter, Marcus Butler, Bella Thorne, Kendall Jenner, Emrata. I don't know who a lot of these people are. Here's some more people. I don't know who literally anyone on here is. I'm so, like, not a part of the world. Uh, some more people I don't know. Yeah, don't know these people. Um, who even is good music? Some more people I don't know. This guy does not look like he belongs. Like, why are you in a suit? You don't... And some of these people don't have that many followers. 44,000 followers? I easily could have been a fire Festival promoter. If the stars had aligned and the timing was different, I easily could have been a fire Festival promoter. But anyway, brand synergy. This is their, their shit. Landowner. This is about the island. So you can see, this is their little businessy deck. Here is an example of more advertising for the actual event. So this is advertising the accommodations. You might notice that this is a line drawing. And it, you can see it's like two double beds, two chairs, this kind of lounge chair. It's called the Duo. Um, boutique housing option for traveling in pairs that includes oh, two twin beds and elevated amenities. The devil comes with two tickets per reservation. Uh, it doesn't say how much it is right here, but it includes the round trip flights. That's an important part that they are paying for the flights for people. So these people don't even have their itinerary for flights when they book the ticket. It's okay if you forgot to put gift, it's fine. It's just if like, if everyone forgot to put gift, it would be a problem. Because if it's just a couple people, it wouldn't add up to enough that I'd have to pay taxes on it. So don't even worry about it. So pretty shortly after they released that video, they uh, get kicked off their island because it literally said exactly what they were told not to say. So the owners canceled the arrangement. Um, apparently the island was heavily used for drug smuggling in the 80s and 90s during the Miami cocaine boom. Also, do we want a stream about the Miami cocaine boom? I live in Miami and like the reason this city is glitzy and glamoury is because a lot of cocaine went through here in the 80s and 90s and paid for a lot of infrastructure. So do you want to learn that? Maybe we can do that another time. I already have next week planned, but maybe the week after. So anyway, the owners of the island were trying to kind of build a new reputation. Um, the IRS gift amount is 6999 Yes, I'm not slacking. I knew, I did not know it was that much. I thought it was 10,000, so that's good to know. But I know I'm going to be collecting less than that. But anyway, um, they wanted to give their island a new reputation, so naturally they're pissed that Bailey McFarland did this. So they get kicked off Norman's K. They only have four months till the festival. 
That stresses me out so bad. It's January, the festival's in April, and they have no location. Like, no. After several smaller islands that seemed like likely venues were turned down, with only two months to go till the festival, the Bahamian government gave McFarland a permit to use a site that was originally for a development called Roker Point, um, just north of Sandals Resort. So material on social media still continued to promote the falsehood that the festival was being hosted on Pablo Escobar's private island, and then altered the map to make it look like this one little area was its own island. In reality, this was in a remote parking lot north of Sandals Resorts and nearby a local marina where there were like locals boats. Like it's literally just a spot on a bigger island that has multiple resorts. Um, Great Exuma is not private, it's not remote, it's one of the larger, more developed islands, and the festival was scheduled to take place on an abandoned resort development. McFarland never announced the location change, because keep in mind, when people book the ticket, the flight is a part of the ticket, so there's, like, in Billy's mind, he's like, well, I don't have to do anything, because I'm just going to handle all of it, they won't know. Um, he just simply renamed the island Fire K, and they had no infrastructure and no villas, and they just have two months to turn this into a fire K situation. So here is a map that was on the promotional materials. This looks like a private island. There's land on all sides, or I mean, there's water on all sides. And you can see the legend here. It kind of says like the stage general admission, these little villas, there's like this water in the middle. Like from this map, it kind of looks like a vibe, a sandals resort parking lot. The person who told me my stream is behind, I just now realized it's so behind. Why did they push so hard for that specific date? They should have given themselves like two years. Because keep in mind, their goal is not to throw a good festival. Their goal is to market their app. And marketing has to happen quick. So that's what I mean. Like their goal was never to do a good job on this. <laughs> which is why they did it really last minute and threw it together. So here's what they say the private island looks like. Here's where it actually is. So you can see like this kind of little shroop de doop of water. And then you can see here is what it actually looks like. And then you can see there's a lot of development down here. These are all like hotels and stuff like that. So again, they're still, then they're posting like aerial photos of it, but it's still not an actual photo of the whole thing. They're still like cutting off all of the edges. Um, and then here is a map that shows Samuel's Endel, Sandals Emerald Bay is like right over here where the little thing is covering. And then you can see here is the essentially abandoned parking lot. Here is some pictures. Again, this was supposed to be like a real estate development. It just kind of went belly up. I'm not really sure what happened, but this is what it looks like from the ground. Like, be so for serious right now. Oh, for those of you on TikTok, if you want to see the pictures, you have to come to Twitch. It's free. It's the first link in my link tree. My username is a Walmart parking lot. I'm a Walmart parking lot everywhere. Um, but that's how you see the pictures. And Twitch is a little bit behind. So you'll, if you go over there, you can still see it. Um, but yeah, I think this really just sums it up. Like this would have taken years. Like there's no running water. There's no lights. There's no electricity. There's a whole lot of nothing. Imagine the fire festival seeing the site. I love this meme of Hillary Clinton. I think this is one of my favorite memes of all time. It is a construction site. So I tried to find more like documented evidence of this, but I couldn't really find anything. But apparently what happened is this site was bought. They were going to build a resort. So that's why it's like, concrete and like gravelly and there's that weird little water loop-de-loop -loop. and then apparently that company like it didn't go through and then someone bought it and they were going to make it residential but that didn't go through either so it was like just this spot and kind of a weird limbo at least there was infrastructure right there that's the one kind of good thing is like they are close to like a grocery store and like other hotels and there is like an airport um, so a couple things that are good about this location, I guess. New user, fire festival parking lot. So two months out, they start to leak festival headliners. So they say that Blink-182 is performing. Other names that joined the artist list were Disclosure, Migos, Little Yachty, uh, Matoma, Clapton, Ten Stake. I, I don't know who any of these people are. I know Migos, Little Yachty, I've heard of, but like ask me to name a song, I can't. Migos, there was, wasn't that the Black Beatles challenge? Was that them? Anyway, Blink-182, I know. Disclosure, I know. Other people, I know. I No clue. No clue. My dream festival lineup would be like Lana Del Rey, Marina and the Diamonds. She's just Marina now, actually. Lady Gaga. That's it. And me. <laughs> 
Um, so it's March 2017. They are low on funds. They do not have a ton of money. They're still trying to pull all of this off and they don't have a ton of money. So they try to get a second round of investment and the employees describe planning meetings as a boys club powwow. They talk about fucking bitches and hoes in conference meetings, according to Vice. And the festival site was nowhere near ready, a former fire festival talent producer told The Cut. This was a development lot covered in gravel with a few tractors scattered around. There was not enough space to build all the tents and green rooms they would need. There was not a long, beautiful beach populated by swimming pigs. However, there were a lot of sand flies that left me looking like I had smallpox. So that's the other thing is like, let's go back to these photos. This is not a beach. This is very high off of the water. And if you look at the edge, that's not a beach that you can walk on. The beach was like a good five, 10 minute drive away. So they're promising people this private island beach experience when in reality, the beach is quite literally not there. Um, so an investor, former uh, fashion executive, Carolia Jan, John, Carolina, I don't know. She arranged for the Firefest to receive a $4 million loan, which they used to rent luxurious offices in Manhattan. If you are tight on money, you better get your ass out to New Jersey and rent some office space out there. What are you doing? Manhattan, go to Kansas. You can plan this from anywhere. It's in the Bahamas. Go to the Bahamas, plan it there. Honestly, they would have done a lot better if they planned in the Bahamas. Cause one thing I wanted to include, but we didn't have time is that, so if you are doing an event in another country, you should buy your supplies in that country. So you don't have to pay import taxes, especially alcohol. They bought alcohol in the U.S. and shipped it there, and then we're going to have to pay 50% import taxes on it. Alcohol has very heavy import taxes. So, like, doing things locally is always cheaper and better. It's a much bigger pain in the ass because you have to get yourself there, but, like, it's just, they should have been there. They should not have ordered the stuff through American companies. But anyway, I digress. So they used it to rent out office space um, with no experience staging the proposed event of this scale. McFarland began approaching companies that did and was reportedly taken aback when he was informed that the event would cost at least five million dollars to stage and in the time that available that he had promised. So he started going around to experts and was like, how do I do this? And they were like, you need more time and more money. And he was like, oh, what? Um, furthermore, the experienced consultants told them that in addition to the cost, the event of this magnitude would need an extra year to plan. He and his associates at FIRE believed it would cost far less and continued plans under that assumption. The organizers tried to do things themselves where possible. McFarland supposedly learned how to rent the stage by doing a Google search. So instead of hiring people that are actual event planners that know what the fuck they're doing, they were Googling like how to rent stage how to book talent, things like that before Tana Klein. So then March 8th, 2017, they post that general admission tickets are sold out. Apparently this was not actually the case. They were not actually sold out but because they realized they were gonna need so much more, so much money. They only wanted to sell VIP tickets because that is a lot more expensive. And where it's saying yachts, homes, and VIP tent packages available, they did not have that. These, these houses and yachts did not exist. They're not, like, that's not a thing. They're not there that they're selling. Um, and then in March 2017, a Twitter named Fire Fraud launches and no one listened or cared. Uh, the first tweet was sent out from Fire Fraud. It was run by a guy named Calvin Wells. He said that he got so fed up with trying to warn people that he just started posting his findings that proved it was going to be a disaster and a scam. This is the level of like in other people's business that I am. I'm so nosy. This is absolutely something I would do. And plus, he was a venture capitalist in New York. So I'm sure he had friends going to this. And he was like, you guys are very stupid. Like, what are you doing? Um, a month before festival guests arrived, he tweeted evidence that the festival was not on a private beach, but in an undeveloped lot next to Sandals Resort. So here is that tweet from March 29th. So you can see there's the screenshots. We already looked at this, but this is where that came from. Is a fraud. They sold tickets to a private island when it's really next to a Sandals resort. So this is real journalism. <laughs> Okay, so scheduled for two weeks in April and May 2017, the event sold day tickets from 500 to 1500 and VIP packages including airfare and luxury tent accommodations for 12,000. Customers were promised accommodation in modern eco-friendly geodesic domes. What does that mean? 
eco-friendly. Everyone says eco-friendly. What do they even mean? Meal, and they were promised meals from celebrity chefs, and the final advertised lineup was 33 artists, including Pusha T, Tiger, Des De Taiga, Designer, Blink-182, Major Laser, Disclosure, Migos, Ray Sermond, K. Trinata, Little Yachty, Matoma, Klingdale, Skepta, Clapton, Lee Youth, Ten Snake, Blondish, and Lee Bridge. That made me feel so old. I don't know who any of those people are. Um... How did they think this was going to turn out? Additionally, the organizers of Firefest planned their first event for April 28th through 30th, which is the same weekend as the Exuma Regatta, which is a Bahamian sailing race. So all of the island's hotels and vacation rentals and resources had been booked months and months and months in advance. So anyone with a brain could tell you you should not do it that weekend because what the fuck's going on what's the exuma boat regatta none of us know let's talk about it it's four days best sailors from all over the bahamas converge on exuma island in one harbor and they do bahamian soldiers arrive prepared to sail their locally built sloops for a best in the bahamas title so it's like a boating competition um the competition is fierce and the atmosphere is alive with excitement and boating enthusiasts all over the world come to the island this has been going on since 1954 and the race remains the main attraction visitors also have other activities there's fashion shows weightlifting competitions beauty pageants volleyball tournaments, tons of parties djs stuff like that the festival took the place the same weekend, so because that festival draws in thousands of people, all the hotels were booked, taxis, cars, like everything is already really, really just booked out because of this. Um, I thought I had a picture of it. I want to show you a picture of it. I want to show you. I thought I included it. I don't know where it went. Okay, I found one. So you can see it's like a boat competition. This looks fun. Lots of boats, they're doing a little sailing thing, having their competition. You can see it's like a big deal. There's a lot of people there. Um, so really terrible idea. They, re they literally could have read the island's wiki page and realize it would clash. Well, it's because they picked the date before they had the location because remember they got kicked off their island so they were supposed to have it somewhere else but this was their only choice i'm from the bahamas and my cousin got the prime minister's cup of that that's cool <gasps> i love when there's someone in the chat that has like a real life connection that's my favorite thing we shouldn't be in the sea and i stand by that this is my logic with the ocean because i love being in the water but i completely agree with you we should not be in the ocean and like this whole Titanic submarine is just proving that my logic with the ocean is you should not go so far that you cannot get yourself back without any assistance. So if you cannot swim back, you don't need to be out there. You know what I mean? So like the stronger of a swimmer you are, the further you can go. So like, you, like I can swim down kind of far and then come back up. But if I need like, a oxygen tank? I shouldn't go down that far. Do you get what I'm saying? Like, don't go beyond your abilities. We'll talk about the Titanic submarine at the end if we have time, okay? We'll talk about it. Or I can talk about it tomorrow. What are you guys doing tomorrow? <laughs> but, oh, but they're going to run out of oxygen tomorrow, so I'd rather talk about it today because it's still funny right now. Yeah, we'll talk about the submarine after class because we're honestly making pretty good time for us, which is surprising. So anyway, on the mainland, 5,000 tickets had been sold and an air service was hired to charter festival goers from Miami and medical service company and caterer were also hired, but the latter withdrew a few weeks before the festival. So with only two weeks to go, they had to hire a new catering service. Originally, they had a $6 million budget for catering. That was chopped to $1 million. So that $6 million was because they promised a uniquely authentic island cuisine, local seafood, Bahamian style sushi, and even a pig roast. So that six million went to one million. So now it's going to be kind of like a ham sandwich vibe. Um, in March 2017, they also hired a veteran event producer, Yaron Levy, who saw that it was impossible to hold the sort of event that McFarlane and Jarul envisioned on the site. 
He assumed they would postpone the event to November as they had been discussing since they were not ready. However, when Fire told him that they would stage the event in the spring anyway, Levy told them to abandon all plans for temporary villas and instead use tents because that was the only accommodation that could be delivered in the time remaining. Because again, you have one month. You think you can build villas in one month? No, tents if you're lucky. Um, and Levy said they needed to jump on this from a marketing perspective. He said that they need to make it clear to people that already bought tickets that this is not a luxury festival and they needed to start pitching it as kind of like a like how at Bonnaroo people camp and that's like part of the thing they were like we got to go that route so that people don't get pissed off with us and they know what to expect um Levy and Byers fire to make sure this was clear to people who had already bought tickets and he says the company assured him that an email was being prepared but he's not sure if it was ever sent out so, Billy McFarland, when industry experts told him that he needed to realign customer expectations and send a transparent messaging that this is not a luxury festival. Again, I think a lot of this could have been avoided if they just sent that email and were like, if you don't want to come, let us know. And I think people still would have gone because people are funny. Yeah, I don't camp. What is that? Bonnaroo. Oh, Bonnaroo is like a music festival. People can up there. So Comcast Ventures, considering invested $25 million into the Fire app, so not the festival, but the app, um, which McFarlane apparently hoped would allow him to finance the festival, but they declined days beforehand. Reportedly, McFarlane had valued Fire Media at $90 million, but was not able to provide proof when Comcast requested actual proof showing that they had that much money or were worth that much money. Um, writing for New York Magazine, one of the event and organizers later noted that since at least mid-March there were significant problems with the planning and at one point they suggested to reschedule the festival for a year later. However, these plans were revoked last minute and the decision was let's go on as we originally planned. And part of the reason that they decided they should just go on as originally planned is that they couldn't cancel it because they had investors and they wouldn't be able to pay them back because they did not have festival insurance. Insurance companies will have event insurance. So if there's like a natural disaster or like something like that, you have insurance and you're covered. They didn't have that. They decided they did not need festival insurance. Because why would you? I don't know if they had other types of insurance. I don't know, but they did not have festival insurance. That's for damn sure. So during this time, Ja Rule came for a site visit discussing how they could possibly pull off the festival with a now limited budget and planning time. And a guy from the festival's marketing team supposedly said, let's just do it and be legends, man. So apparently that's what Ja Rule said. Uh, I've gotten very mixed reporting on that. Later that month, Page Six began reporting rumors that they were too disorganized and over their head. And after the Comcast deal fell through, McFarland obtained some temporary financing through Ezra Birnbaum that required the company to repay at least $500,000 within 16 days. Um, and if your boss ever said, let's just do it and be legends, man, run run. Just absolutely get out of there as quickly as you possibly can. So another similar report I found is that Gordon said some planners on the ground asked if it was best to just roll over everyone's tickets to 2018 and start planning for next year. And Ja Rule wasn't hearing it. And he said to living like movie stars, partying like rock stars and fucking like porn stars and then toasted and they decided to just keep going. So again, everyone that like knows things is saying that they should cancel it. Um, and in order to raise quick cash for the event, they decided that they are just gonna have people pay for everything in advance. So they send an email and they're like, this is gonna be a cashless event. So you need to load money onto your fire band and they were giving people like wristbands that you would scan to pay. Um, so they told people to load like a few hundred dollars per day is what they said that they would need it. And they said each attendee would be issued an RFID equipped smart like watch using ID during the festival. And this is the thing is like, it's like at Disney, you have those little scanning bracelets. Those are great. They work very well when you have Wi-Fi, when you have reliable internet, when you're scanning it to a machine that is hardwired with power and internet 
that is a phenomenal system. They work very well. I have worked events that use these, so I know that they work. When they're plugged in, if you don't have that, it's very difficult to use a system like that because when you're scanning it, if it doesn't have Wi-Fi quickly, it's going to lag. So you cannot just easily scan tons of people and you're going to be putting your bartenders behind. You're going to be putting everybody behind. RFID, really fucking idiotic decision. So McFarlane, who signed the email, suggested that they deposit 300 to 500 for every day that they plan to attend. And about $2 million from festival goers was taken for these bracelets. 40% was used to pay off that short-term loan. So they are really like at this stage in planning, they are thinking 15 minutes in advance. Like they are not able to plan long-term. Like in the documentaries, they're saying it was like whackable. Like you'd have like problem, 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 problem. Like you can't think in advance because you're just surrounded by problems all the time. Um, telling people how to load cash on bracelets and they don't even have <laughs> housing. They are literally lying for <laughs> men in charge. White men think they can create Wi-Fi on command. It's like air, dude. It's like watching a slow motion disaster. This is my first time on Twitch. It's so much better. See, those of you on TikTok, Twitch is where it's at. Anyone who has worked in special events and has had to scan things, like I can think would see that this is a terrible idea. Like, so I used to work at a hotel and we used like digital stuff for everything. Like we had little things to take people payments. Everything was digital. Like it was cards, but it was digital. When they, the power went out because there was a really bad storm and they had me, I had to do all the credit cards because we were using the knuckle buster. I don't know if you know what that is. Let me find a picture of it. This is what they should have been doing. This is what you need to use when you don't have Wi-Fi. So do, 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 do. This is called a knuckle buster because when you put a credit card on it, basically what you do is you put someone's credit card right there and then you put receipt paper over it and you like slide it across and it hurts your knuckles really bad because you're like sliding your knuckles on hard metal and it takes like a print of the person's credit card so that when you do have access to a computer, you enter everything in and you charge them then and it shows that they like signed off on it and you had their physical credit card. This is what you do when you don't have internet or Wi-Fi. I know this because I have had to do it and it hurts like a motherfucker, which is why people do not throw music festivals in the middle of nowhere. It's as simple as that. An imprinter. We use that at our restaurant when our Wi-Fi goes out. Exactly. It's like how you take, so here's a better, you can kind of see how it works a little better from some of these. This is a good picture. So you put the person's credit card, you have the receipt, you write how much you're charging them, they sign it, you go and take a scan of it. Um, why wouldn't you just use a pen? Because it's like, you need the physical scan of the card for like legal, I don't know. It's faster and more like secure, I guess. Okay, so back to Fire Festival. Glad we could educate everyone who had never heard of that. Um, why didn't they just get a Bahamian internet service considering they ended up on a populated island? Because that takes time. Like, I'm sure they could have, and that Bahamian internet service could have run internet lines and put up Wi-Fi modems, but like, they only had a few months, so they didn't have to do that. Um, so then employees start getting instructed to delete negative comments on social media. Jerry Media employees were told to keep promoting the festival like business as usual, and keep in mind, that video we watched and all the marketing stuff was created on the original island by Jerry Media. Jerry Media has never been to the new island and they have no idea what's going on. So all of their marketing materials are still from the original place that they have since been kicked out of. Um, do, 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 do. Allegedly, they knew it was going to be a disaster, though, because when they were asking for information, they were like getting nothing. Oren Axe, an ex Jerry Media designer hired to do social media for Fire, said that he was personally instructed to delete any negative or accusatory comments on Instagram, even simple logistical questions, and to block any accounts that left such comments. He was told to flag on social general, on Fire's social general words. So flag means like filter out words like lineup, performers, details, info. Flights, fraud, stupid, scam, and festival. Festival. 
And this guy said, I could say I'm scared. I could say this is dangerous. Axe remembers one of the last days before the festival. It won't change anything because the festival has to happen. Instead of helping, just delete. Blocked, deleted, it's over. The festival attendee who paid thousands of dollars. Hey, I was wondering what time my flight is and if my room will have Wi-Fi. The fire festival social media team. You're done. You're done. We don't ask those kind of questions. You're done. <laughs> what if they never answer the door? Imagine like you paid thousands of dollars to go to this event and then you literally leave a comment being like, hey, how is the flight situation working? And then they block you. Would you go? I wouldn't go. I would just dispute the charge on my credit card at that point and not go. I'd be like, that was fucking weird. Um, so warning signs start dropping in April, less than a month before the festival. Um, one of the first articles detailing issues came out. The Wall Street Journal reported on April 2nd that the artists had not been paid. VIP guests did not have their travel itineraries with flight information and claimed that the festival was wooing the wealthy just to make ends meet. How do people pay money for things without knowing every detail first? I'm the same way. I want to know everything. Like right now, so I'm moving into a new house and my new landlord doesn't have like a blueprint floor plan. And it's literally like giving me heart palpitations that I don't have a blueprint of like the dimensions. I've seen it in person. Like I have physically been in the house. I know that it's fine, but I just really want the dimension. <laughs> it's really bad. So anyway, so... It's the night before the festival. Everything is a shit show. The day laborers have still not been paid. The artists have not been paid. No one's getting paid. And a strong storm the night before the gates opened took down half of the tents the morning the guests were scheduled to arrive. Apparently there was a terrible storm, the awful wind, and it literally fucked like half the stuff that they had been setting up for weeks. Um, again, they don't have festival insurance. They Are we going to talk about that dude who was going to give head to pay it off? Absolutely, we are. Um, I just hit purchase without thinking. Get wrecked, said Mother Nature. She was giving them one last chance to cancel because they could have maintained their reputation. If they had festival insurance, they could have canceled the day before and been like, we're so sorry. There's terrible weather. We're just worried it's not going to be safe. And like people would have been pissed, but they would have gotten over it. I would ask Sandals if they had a room. Remember, it's the big giant like boat sailing competition. So everything's been booked for like a year in advance because this happens every year and it's like the biggest event on the island. How do you have a festival without <laughs> festival insurance? So it's April 27th. It's the morning of April 27th and it's festival day, baby. It's festival day. So let's see what the fuck happened on April 27th. So the first flights from Miami International Airport landed at 6.20 a.m. The part that I think is fucking funniest is that they were like so stressed. Everything's wet. All the tents are fucked up. And the flight showed up 30 minutes early. It was supposed to be there at 6.50. And it got there at 6.20 so here is a picture from the promo. It's like this little private jet. And then here is the actual plane, one of them that they sent down there. It's literally just like a big ass like Spirit Airlines plane that they put the Fire Festival logo on. And they got there early. They're early. It's so funny that they were 30 minutes early. And 30 minutes is pretty early for a flight that's that short. From Miami to the Bahamas is a very fast flight. Um, and then the day that people are supposed to arrive, Blank 182 pulled out of the lineup. So they tweeted a notes app announcement. They said, regrettably, and after much careful and difficult consideration, we want to let you know that we won't be performing at the Fire Fest in the Bahamas this weekend and next weekend. We were not confident that we would have what we need to give you quality performances we always give our fans. So very vague. We don't have what we need. That could mean anything. That could mean like I demand peanut M&Ms at every event I perform at and they don't have them so I'm not coming. Or that could mean they don't have electricity. That could mean almost anything. They were building the rest of those tents in 30 minutes. I can't do a farmer's market without insurance for my baking business, but he can do a whole festival. Exactly. Exactly. 
Um, when you land early, that's more time for you to help the organizers dig holes in the ground for toilets. So, um, wait, this isn't supposed to be here. That's too early. So, around the time that Blink-182 bailed, attendees started flooding Reddit and Twitter with complaints that the grounds were not ready and when they arrived on Thursday, April 27th. So, initial arrivals were taken to an impromptu beach party at a beachside restaurant where they were plied with alcohol and kept waiting around for six hours while frantic preparations at the festival site continued. So, they picked him up from the airport. They're like, let's take him to this beach restaurant. They can get drunk. They can hang out. It'll buy us some time. They're basically just stalling. So McFarland had hired hundreds of local Bahamian workers to help build the site and organizers had to, meanwhile, organizers had to renegotiate the guarantees they offered to people who would be playing at the festival as costs started to spiral out of control. Later, arriver, uh, later arrivals were taken directly to the grounds by school buses where the true state of the festival site became apparent. Their accommodations were little more than scattered disaster relief tents with dirt floors and some mattresses were soaking wet as a result of the morning rain. Gourmet food accommodations were nothing more than inadequate and poor quality food, including cheese sandwiches served in foam containers. So let's look through some of the pictures of this day. So here is what the tents look like. Impromptu beach party, like the entire festival wasn't wrapped in a wish, wasn't wish wrapped in a prayer. They should have had Grant and Billy put on a puppet show to stall. Those idiots weren't doing anything helpful. It's 5 p.m. somewhere, and what if 5 p.m. lasted six hours? That's your celebrity food. So here's the tents. Here's what it looks like when people arrived. This is not at the end. This is when people arrived. I'm glad you think this is better info than the Netflix doc. This is the part, okay, so that's when they arrived. Here's people with their luggage approaching the tent. So you can see the sun starting to set. I guess this is later arrivals. This is the part that gets me is this lone porta potty. The fact that they had no bathrooms really, like no real infrastructure, just this individual porta potty. And then here's more pictures of the festival grounds. You can see mattresses are still in the little wrappings just stacked on top of each other. Here's a giant stack of mattresses with the FEMA tents. Um, I don't know if there was one porta potty in the entire place, but there was one porta potty around that large cluster of tents. So I don't know. This is the luxury concierge. It's literally just a little, like I could make this with stuff from Home Depot. BYOM, bring your own mattress. No infrastructure, just vibes. Expectation versus reality. So I guess this was some kind of rendering from the ads, and then like this is what they actually pulled up on. Um, and then, oh, for those of you on TikTok, if you want to see the pictures, you have to come to Twitch. So sorry, it's the first link on my link tree. And then they gave them these secure lockers to put their stuff in, but they did not tell the people that they needed to bring a lock. To not tell them that they need a lock, could they leave because I would see that and immediately want to leave? Kind of. Remember, they were flown here by fire festival. So that was a fire festival plane. So they'd have to, they like, they're not being held hostage at this point, but there's limited options to leave. And remember, because there's this huge sailing competition, there's no cabs, there's no Ubers, there's no hotels, there's nothing. I feel like at 18, I could plan a better festival. Here is the iconic cheese sandwich, I guess. Cheese bread, cheese sandwich. This guy was actually there. His tweet says, here's the dinner they fed us tonight. Literally slices of bread, cheese, and a salad with no dressing. <laughs> this looks like my middle school lunch. Here is a picture of them getting their food in this little tent. Like, they literally look like they're on a mission trip don't they like isn't this giving very strong mission trip energy not the craft singles oh, god um here's people just kind of sitting around and apparently this is the part that gets me at this point billy mcfarland was telling the people working he was like just play music as loud as you fucking can so music is just blasting like club music is blasting so fucking loud, like so loud. So all of this is going on and then there's just super loud music playing. Um, I had much better food on mission trips. And then here is how they collected their luggage. So again, 
they were on a fire festival plane. So if you checked your bag, they were like, we'll take it to the festival. We'll drop it off at your tent. Then they get there. It's two large shipping containers and they just open them and it's nighttime. There's no lights. There's no luggage tags. There's no system. And they say, find your bag. It's in here. Go find your bag. It's somewhere in there. So go find it. And keep in mind, the people that got taken to the beach party, they didn't realize something was wrong. So most of them were drunk. So by the time they get to this, they've already been drunken in the sun for hours because they think, oh, I'm going to be drinking and then I'm going to go to my little tent. I'll go to sleep and then we'll go to the band thing. So they're like drunk, sandy, dirty, sweaty, sunburned, whole hot mess express. So here is a couple of videos that we're going to watch on Twitter. I would have thought I was about to be trafficked. Okay, so here is early report that many tents aren't assembled, and this is from before the festival. This is from the day of, I think. Okay. It's super blurry, but you can kind of see the vibes. Those are your You can see it's cloudy, the rain had just stopped. No, no showers. So you can see it literally looks like a disaster town zone. It must have reeked, probably. Disgusting. Literally horrifying. So there's more bathrooms. This is like Survivor. There's still trucks everywhere. So that video is way too loud and it's actually horrifying. But you get the point. Here is another one. So apparently what's happening here is staff was trying to check people in. Staff was like checking people in and they had about like half the people checked in. Apparently there were about 500 people that actually made it there and showed up. They were checking them in, figuring out who was gonna go where, kind of starting to get it together a little bit. And then apparently Billy McFarland just gets on a table and says, hey, if you, if you bought the luxury villa package and you just find an empty tent and take it. So like, all that work that they had been doing immediately got undone and it became like a free for all. So this is from a guy that was there, William Needleham Finley the fourth. He was doing a lot of the on-site reporting. So see the music, there's the school bus. There's Billy. There's a little concierge thing you saw a picture of. He looks like he's leading a church cult. The fourth. This is that's that's it right there. There's the porta potties. There's the luggage containers. <laughs> Why does he have such an aggressive rich person name? I have no idea. Um, but yeah, this is a hot mess express. So here is a news report from kind of like the day of of what's going on talking about. This is what I wanted y'all to see yeah, is this impromptu story. restaurant party. So let's talk about some context about everything we just watched, the tweets, the videos, all that stuff. So that bar owner only got 20 minutes warning before all those people were there for six hours. And that same woman, she had been providing a lot of the food for the people working on site. So she had been doing all this cooking. She had hired tons of people. This woman had been working like 24 seven trying to get ready for this. And they totally fucked her over both the day of and later they didn't pay her. Um, I can't remember if I included this later, but she was in the documentary and people set up a GoFundMe for her. Oh, I did include it later, I forgot. Customer service hell, exactly. Only 20 minutes warning for a giant group of people that were not even supposed to be there. Like they were just supposed to go straight to the festival site. So the school buses that they used to cart people to the festival grounds had no fire employees on it. So imagine getting on a school bus with no employees of the festival that you were supposed to go to. It's a miracle that these people didn't get human trafficked. It would have been so easy to human traffic them. Um, 
And apparently the drivers were like spilling tea because they were local drivers. So they were like, yeah, I've been driving past this. It's been a shit show for a month. Like everything's been a shit show. It's going to be awful. Like that's for you right there. Um, and Billy kept telling them, turn the music up, turn the music up. And then the staff kept saying, turn it down. We're trying to check people in. We're trying to figure out what the fuck's going on. They checked in a couple hundred people. And then Billy stood on that table and said, anyone who got a villa, go ahead and just grab a tent. And then it became a mob mentality. So what people were saying is that because at this point it's giving like natural disaster vibes, people were going and claiming a tent. And then because they didn't want other people near them because people were looting, they were going through and destroying other tents. So taking the mattresses out of them. I even saw one guy was saying, he was like, yeah, me and my buddies went and pissed in all the tents around us so that no one would sleep near us. So we knew like no one would steal our stuff or whatever, which doesn't even make sense. But it just turned into like a total Lord of the Flies situation. And people started like hoarding stuff. So people were like, oh, I found toilet paper. Let me take this giant box of it because I don't know if I'm going to be able to get any more. Like people just naturally went to their like lizard brain place and started being terrible to each other. Um, and I think this story really just represents the entire vibe of the employees. The people I feel the worst for is the Bahamian day laborers because they never got paid a lot of them and then fire employees because a lot of them were getting paid while they were there and then they ended up the company like ended but that's my order of empathy so andy he was a co-founder and principal at inward point an event design company um so he had like a successful event career before this he explains that customs was holding four 18 wheeler trucks filled with evian water at the airport so again if you were an actual event planner, you would know that you should use a local provisioning company so you do not have to pay import taxes on the water because a local provisioning company, it's local. You don't have to pay an extra tax to fly it there and import, you know, like it's just very stupid. Um, so customs was asking for $175,000 because that is how much the taxes were. It's very expensive to import stuff to other countries. Um, to release the water to festival goers who were currently stranded without much food or resources. So this is before the festival had, was canceled, but after festival goers had arrived. So they ended up canceling the festival, obviously. But at this point, I think this is like the morning of. So people are starting to get there and they have no water for them. People are getting there and they have again, I will reiterate, no water for them. None. So here is Andy King's story about this. I'm not going to talk about that. <laughs> Let me tell you something. We had four containers filled, four 18-wheeler trucks filled with Evian water. But I had left the week before for two days to go to meetings in Bermuda for the America's Cup. And when I came back, I missed the big meeting with Customs. And of course, Customs had said to Billy and the gang, you need to pay us $175,000 in cash today for us to release the water. I went down. Well, Billy called me. I'm going to speak completely, um, you know, this won't go that far, I'm sure. But Billy called and said, Andy, we need you to take one big thing for the team. And I said, oh, my gosh, I've been taking something for the team every day. He said, well, you're our wonderful gay leader, and we need you to go down. Will you suck dick to fix this water problem? And I said, Billy, what? I said, Andy? If you will go down and suck Cunningham's dick, who's the head of customs, and get him to clear all of the containers with water, you will save this festival. And I literally drove home, took a shower, I, 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 I drank some mouthwash, I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm really, and I got into my car to drive across the island to take one for the team. And I got to his office fully prepared to suck his dick. But he couldn't have been nicer. And he's like, Andy, listen, I will release all the water. I will let you serve it. But I want to, be, want to be one of the first people to be paid this import fee for what you're doing. And I said, OK, great. And I got back and I had all the water that we needed. <laughs> Can you imagine in my 30 years of a career that this is what I was going to do? I was going to do that. I There is so much to unpack. I'm just going to give you guys a moment to like marinate in that and like sit on that for a second. I'm just going to give you a second to handle that. Our gay leader.
He's so dedicated. Like I, I just, I really just want to give you guys a second to like process what just happened. That's what happened. I need someone that loyal to me. <laughs> Queer icon. Where was HR? HR is not in sight. There is no fire festival HR. He could put that on his resume. Imagine in a job interview where they're like, describe a time when you had to be a team player at work. Boy, do I have a story for you. <laughs> it's incomprehensible. Okay, so <laughs> moving on from the sucking dick for Evian Water story. Apparently, allegedly, they did have fancy villas, but McFarlane lost the keys. I don't believe that they ever existed. Um, Fire Festival attendees were promised those fancy mansions and stuff like that, but as famously documented on Twitter, they were greeted with the Fire Festival FEMA tents, um, and Billy McFarlane said, we had 250 houses rented out for millions of dollars with paper receipts and pictures of every house. We had a box of physical keys and cars to take people there and maps for every house. And the box of keys, uh, unfortunately, it went missing. I do not believe that for a fucking second. Those keys never existed. I'm going to tell you that right fucking now. Like, those keys and those houses were never real. Billy, that is like the way a four-year-old lies. A four-year-old lies so blatantly like that. A four-year-old is like, oh, uh, I did have it, but I lost it. Like, what's wrong with you? And why would you keep all of the keys together? Like, I, because I work in a real estate office, I sometimes have to, like, accept keys. And, like, you put it in an envelope with, like, the thing on it. And then you put those in a thing that lock. It, like, it's, you handle it. You know what I mean? Are there no, no locksmiths in the Bahamas? Apparently not. And apparently the owners of said properties could not be contacted. Because one time, this is exactly what happens. I was staying in, uh, it was like an Airbnb, but I got it through VRBO. Um, I was staying in a condo on the beach and I lost the keys to it. They fell out of my bag when I was walking on the beach. I have no idea where the fuck they went, still to this day. This is actually kind of a spooky story I wanna tell you. So I lost the keys to the condo and I called the owner and I was like, hey, I just lost these keys on the beach. And the owner told me to go to this office that was like a property management office and they had a spare key that they gave to me and then they just charged, and they said like, we're just gonna charge you like $150 for the lost key. And I was like, okay, cool. But then this is the spooky part. A couple days later, cause I was there for like a week, the key that I lost was hanging on the outside of the door. I don't know how, who the fuck found it. I don't know how they knew what unit that key was for, the whole thing creeps the shit out of me. I have no idea. But also I was dating a really abusive guy at that time. So part of me thinks maybe he stole the keys to like make my self esteem bad and then he replaced it. I really like that's not, like I'm not joking. That like just came to me as a possibility. I've never thought about that. Maybe that was it. Damn. Hindsight's 2020. Um, back to fire Festival. Billy is also the type to just leave all the doors unlocked. Your self-esteem. <laughs> Did you get your money back though? No, because they told me they were going to charge me for the key at the end. And then because I found it again, they never charged me for it because I found it. No, I did not have to pay the 150 because how else would that have happened? Like how else would someone have known it was for that unit? I bet he like took it out. Like he was crazy. I bet he like took it out of my purse because I like, ugh, we're not even going to get into it right now. <laughs> Okay, so anyway, he lost the key to all of the houses. Um, although there were only about 500 people, there were not enough tents and beds for the guests, so they wound up stealing from each other. Attendees were unable to leave for the nearby Sandals Resort because almost every single hotel was fully booked. And around nightfall, local musicians took to the stage and played for a few hours. I want to talk to the local music musicians because... They really saw an opportunity. They were like, Blink-182 canceled and there's a bunch of rich white people standing around doing nothing? Get on that stage, get on that stage. I would have done the exact same thing if I was them. Like, let's get on that stage. Um, oh man, stop talking about the key. I don't want to think about it. 
much. Anyway, so around nightfall, the local musicians started performing and they were the only act to perform at the event. In the early morning, it was announced that the festival would be postponed and that the attendees would be returned to Miami as soon as possible. Reports from the festival mentioned various other problems such as the mishandling or theft of guest baggage, no lighting to help people find their way around, unfinished gravel lot, lack of medical personnel or event staff, no cell phone or internet service, not enough porta potties, no running water, and heavy handed security. These problems are exacerbated by the festival having been promoted as a cashless event, leaving many attendees without money for taxi fare or other expenses. So again, because it's cashless, a lot of people didn't bring any money, which is also really fucking stupid. You should always bring cash with you. Even if you, if, let me just say this now, because I know a lot of young people watch this. If you are going far from your home, I don't care if it's a cashless event. I don't care if you have your debit card with you. I don't care. You never know what's going to happen. If you are in a faraway place with lots of random people, have cash in the local currency on your person. It is shocking how much $200 can make a difference. If there have been times, because I've traveled a lot internationally, that like I got in a situation and I was so glad that I had cash. One time I was out, it was late at night, I didn't know the area I was in and I paid for a very, very overpriced cab, but I was very happy I had cash with me. So if you are ever going on like a trip or an endeavor, protective teacher mode activated. So if you're ever going on a trip or a big party or an endeavor or whatever, keep some cash on you. You don't know what's gonna happen. It's just, it's better to have it and not need it. You know, so if I was a fire Festival attendee, I would have had like $200 in the local currency. I don't know what currency they use in the Bahamas, but unfathomably common misredacted face take. My mother always said the same, keep some cash on your person so you can get somewhere in an emergency. And I don't do that all the time. Like a lot of times when I go out, I just take my phone, which just has my license and my debit card. But if you're going somewhere you don't usually go, you don't know anybody there, you don't speak the language, like anything, have cash with you. Um an endeavor or whatever. So anyway, many, many attendees were reportedly stranded and flights were canceled after the Bahamian government issued an order that barred any planes from landing at the airport. Because everything was such a shit show, the government was like, shut it down. Everybody shut it down. Nothing's going on. Um, so April 28th, remember April 27th is the day the festival started. The situation goes from bad to worse as organizers admit defeat and cancel the event among a flit of reports of disgruntled attendees on the ground about shockingly poor conditions. They said, due to circumstances outside of our control, the physical infrastructure was not in place on time and we are unable to fulfill on the vision that vision safely and enjoyably for our guests, a statement from the organizers released Friday morning reads. The festival is being postponed until we can further assess what if and when we're able to create the high quality experience we envisioned. And then the Bahamian Ministry of Tourism, which is basically just like the government's tourism office, issued their own statement blaming the fire festival organizers. It said the event organizers assured us that all measures were taken to ensure a safe and successful event, but clearly they did not have the capacity to execute an event of this scale. A team of ministry tourism representatives is on the island to assist with the organization of a safe return of all fire festival visitors. It's our hope that fire festival visitors would continue returning to the island of the Bahamas in the future to truly experience all of our beauty. I feel bad for these people. That's a fucking PR nightmare. Like, they didn't do anything. They are just trying to throw their fucking boat racing party. They didn't ask for this. And then Ja Rule had his own statement on Twitter, which we... Oh, I thought I included it. It's a notes app apology, but I will read it to you. He said, we are working right now on getting everyone of the island safe. That is my immediate concern. I will make a statement soon. I'm heartbroken at this moment. My partners and I wanted to be this to be an amazing event in all caps, it was not a scam, as everyone is reporting. I don't know how everything went left, but I'm working to make it right by making sure everyone is refunded. I truly apologize, as this is, in caps, not my fault, but I'm taking responsibility. <laughs> I'm deeply sorry to everyone who was inconvenienced by this. I think inconvenience is a bit light of a word. Um, then a short time later, Ja Rule and McFarlane released a joint statement to Billboard apologizing for the mess and promising full refunds as well as free VIP passes for next year's redo. Um, they started a partnership over a mutual interest in technology, the ocean and rap music. Just, uh, sorry, I didn't mean to include that. This says a lot that didn't need to happen. Oh no, this is their whole ass statement. This is super long. We're not going to read all of this. Whatever. 
you can see. We set up water and waste management, brought an ambulance from New York. You didn't need to bring an ambulance from New York. Again, great example of how they have no event experience. You should have hired a local medical company. There are companies that do this. Like there are event companies that provide on-site local stuff. Like this is a thing. You don't have to ship an ambulance from New York. That was so unnecessary. Um, chartered 737 planes, 12 flights a day. We thought we were ready, but then everyone arrived. Literally so stupid. It's like they didn't think the Bahamas had anything besides a beach. Exactly. So the first flight back to Miami boarded at 1.30 a.m. on April 28th, but was delayed for hours due to issues with the flight manifest because apparently the list of people they had for the flight did not match up with the number of people physically on the plane. And that's really important. When they the plane goes of room and goes by, they have a manifest that says exactly how many people are on the plane, staff and like guests with their names and their birthdays and like all that stuff. So they can't leave unless that's perfect. So they get that list like right before they leave and the list they had had like, I don't know the correct numbers, but let's say the list had 50 people on it and there were 53 people on the plane. They can't leave till they figure out what the fuck's going on. Um, it was canceled after sunrise and then passengers were locked in the airport terminal without access to food, water, or air conditioning. So they put them on the plane and then they're like, there's a problem. We have to get you off the plane and put you back in the airport, which is fucking bananas to me. Here's another Twitter video. We've been locked indoors with no air, food, and no water. So literally they're locking them inside because apparently people started to get like really rowdy and were like yelling and stuff. So the Bahamian police were like, fuck this, we're gonna lock you inside, y'all are crazy. So yeah, they're locked in the airport. Hate that for them. Um, and then the vendors weren't paid. So Bahamian locals are currently owed $150,000 in day wages. Day wages is like all the randos that they hired to like put the tents together, set up those little concierge things, build the stage. A lot of times those people are referred to as day laborers because you pay them per day. So they're like, oh, we'll give you $50 a day. Like they're not paid by the hour and they're not like an employee where they sign everything. It's like just a kind of like more cut and dry situation. So they never got paid the money that was owed to them. The head of Bahamian tourism, minister of finance and head of the University of Bahamas were waiting for over a million dollars. I'm not sure what the university has to do with this, but apparently they did. The restaurant owner, the one that had the bar that we she was in the movie, we showed the things in the bar. Um, they owe, she had to go through $50,000 of her own savings in order to pay staff out of pocket. And that she said her team worked around the clock preparing a thousand meals a day for festival staff but then they went unpaid um and thankfully she uh because she was in the documentary people raised more than one hundred and seventy-seven thousand dollars for the bahamian restaurant and i'm assuming a lot of that went to the day laborers as well but i was really happy to hear that she did get not her money back but she did get support and money given to her because it was not fair that she had lost like her entire life savings due to these fucking idiots event um so in early May, an audio of fire media conference call was obtained by Vice News, where McFarland tells his employees that they won't be paid. He said, after, a, after conferring with our council and all financial people, we conferred with all financial people, every single one of them. Um, he said, unfortunately, we are not able to proceed with payroll. And then he said, we're not firing anyone. We're just letting you know that there will be no payroll in the short term. We're not fired. If you're not fired, you just aren't going to get paid anymore. This is this has been converted into an unpaid internship. Um, McFarland tells the staff of the company that they will be focused on the talent booking platform that he still believes is profitable. And when someone on the call asks about being contacted by the FBI, McFarland replies that that concern is more of an individual thing. Ja Rule is on the call too, but he muted his audio because of bad reception. And then May is when all the repercussions came pouring in for Ja Rule and McFarland. They were both banned from visiting the Bahamas for life, and numerous lawsuits named both of them, including a legal wire transfers and tricking people to come by paying influencers to market the festival, general negligence and violation of consumer protection law. 100% sure counsel would not say that. So apparently the other thing that was said on this conference call is when he said like, 
we're not firing anyone. We're just letting you know that there's no payroll. One of the employees was like, so you're not laying us off. Does that, that means we can't file for unemployment. Cause if you quit, you can't get unemployment. And on the call, he was like, I don't really know about like the government benefits situation. That's not really my department, but we're just, we're not firing you. So yeah, those people couldn't even file for unemployment. So that's what I mean. Like I do feel really bad for these people, but I don't feel nearly as bad for them as I do for the, as I do feel bad for the Bahamians who never got paid. Just my personal stake. So then July, 2017, McFarland is arrested. Um, it, he was taken by FBI agents for wire fraud that could have ended up costing him 20 years in prison, but he got out on bail. At the time, he was also being sued for $100 million worth of class action lawsuits, and the court documents actually included the line that it was closer to Hunger Games, of, uh, Hunger Games or Lord of the Flies than Coachella. And then... In 2017, December 2017, another scam arises. In the Hulu documentary, um, Seth Crossno says that he and others who attended the failed festival started receiving emails with the subject line, NYC VIP access. This is something that people do in marketing. They purchase email lists. So let's say, I'm not doing this. I don't have your email addresses, just to reiterate, but I'm just using this as a hypothetical. Let's say, all of you had to give me your email address for something, whatever. Maybe I was hosting like a meet and greet and you had to give me your email address. I could sell a list of you guys' emails and be like, hey, this is mostly 20 somethings that are interested in internet culture. And I could sell that to a company who would then send you products. Like that's a way, that's like a big profit thing on the internet. That's kind of what Jen Shaw was doing if you were here for the Jen Shaw stream. So apparently, they sold or were using the Fire Festival email list. And the emails that they were getting offered tickets to big events that normally you can't buy tickets to, like the Met Gala, but it was also Victoria's Secret Fashion Show, Burning Man. Um, and it turns out that New York NYC VIP Access was another McFarland venture. According to BuzzFeed News, he sold over $100,000 worth of fraudulent tickets on this email scam while he was quite literally out on bail. He was out on bail when he did this. And then his fate was sealed in October 2018. He was sentenced to six years in prison. He ended up actually being released after four years um, for charges involving Firefest and NYC VIP access and defrauding festival goers and investors. He pled guilty to two counts of wire fraud and did so again twice for the fake tickets. And as Refinery29 reported, dozens of regular personal lawsuits await him as well. So that brings us to present day. I forgot one thing. Let me pull it up really fast. Give me one second. Sorry, I had a video save that I meant to put in here. I knew I was forgetting something. Damn it. Okay, I think I found it. No, I didn't. I'll find it while you guys are playing the game, I think. So, 17th of May, 2023. The founder of the 2017's disgraced Firefest claims that he has secured adequate funds to pay off his debts and launch a new version of the festival and develop a Broadway musical about the original event. In March of this year, McFarlane laid out his plans to repay the $26 million he owes to investors. He said, here's how I'm going to pay it back. I spend half my time filming TV shows. The other half, I focus on what I'm really, really good at. I'm the best at coming up with wild, creative, getting talent together, and delivering the moment. You have not delivered the moment. You've delivered nothing. He added, concluding with his tweet with a number at which people could contact him with new business opportunities. Now the Firefest founder has stated that he has secured enough funding to not only clear the debt like we said, but launch a 2.0 version of the festival. And I just remembered how I can find this video for you. Okay, I found it. Copy link. I'm going to text it to myself so I can show it to you. Sorry for the delay, but I promise you it is going to be worth it. Literally never delivered a moment. I feel like Billy McFarlane right now because I forgot to put this fucking video on the slides for you. 
So before we get to the sources, let me show you this video where they are announcing the new failed endeavor. Let me make sure it's the right video before I play it. Okay, found it. So this is their Firefest 2.0 promo, if my fucking computer will load. That's Andy, Andy King. Oh my God, Billy, round two? Yes, but first, we're going to Coachella. Whoa, whoa, wait. This didn't go so well last time. Breaking news, Billy McFarland's fire pig fights on his bum. And there's so much that can go wrong. Not this time. Lincoln bio, cut. So, that's Firefest 2.0. I fucking guess. Let's see, I wanna Google it and see if there's, we can buy tickets. Should we all buy tickets? So yeah, he's just announced it, but there's no like other things. Cause he just announced it like less than a month ago or about a month ago. Coke is a weird drug. So that is Fire Festival. I also, I decided I wanted to start including my sources because one, I wanna give people credit for their work. Now that I'm doing more like pop culture stuff, I'm using a lot of blogs. So I wanna people give, give people credit as opposed to when I'm using like Britannica, whatever. But I wanted to share my sources with you so that you can see. He said on Tana's podcast, he doesn't have a location or a date. Yeah, so it is real. He is trying to do it. That video is very much real, but he really has nothing done so far. Um, but here are my sources from today. We got Wikipedia. We got Wikipedia a couple times, Refinery29, Billboard, Vanity Fair, Forbes, Hey Alma, um, Exuma Bahamas, and Vulture. These are the sources that I use. I know some people are kind of curious about how I put the stream together. Basically, I did like just do tons of research and then I decide like what kind of story arc I want to tell. So like, what do I want to start with? Do like this order I want to go. And then I just pull from my research. So lots of slides have pieces from multiple, multiple sources. So a lot of people are asking for next week to talk about TanaCon, but we already have a topic for next week. Next week, we will be talking about Anna Delvey. I'm very excited about Anna Delvey. TanaCon is a good topic, but it's just too similar to Firefest. We need we need some space in between them. So we are going to be talking about Anna Delvey next week. And just to give a reminder, next week's stream will be on Tuesday. Tuesday, 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 Tuesday. Is there going to be a stream on Wednesday? No, there will be stream on Tuesday. So on Wednesday, I'm moving, the movers will be here, so all my shit's gonna be packed up, so stream is gonna be on Wednesday. Yes, turn on Twitch notifications, on, or stream's gonna be on Tuesday, sorry, because I'll be packing on Wednesday and crying and moving. So, do you send notifications for when the episodes start? So apparently, if you log into Twitch on your phone, you can request a push notification. Um, I need Elizabeth Holmes, Billy McFarlane, and Anna in her room together. Yes, so I will see you guys on Tuesday for our Anna Delvey stream. Um, but for now, let's go ahead and play the game. So if you are not familiar with my stream and the game that we play, it is just a 10 question trivia game. I'm gonna put the information to join in the chat. We are gonna do the beach one because we were in the Bahamas. So if you would like to play this game, I am not asking you for money. I'm not asking you for your email address. I'm not asking you to make an account. I'm not asking for anything. And yes, we will talk about the submarine as soon as we're done with the game, I promise. Um, it is gonna, you're gonna go to join.nearpod.com or you can download the app, but you don't have to. You do not have to make an account. You don't have to make an account. You don't have to enter your email. Just go to join.nearpod.com. You can do it on your phone or a computer and enter the code A-J-N-T-G. A-J-N-T-G. I'll give you a couple seconds to do that. It's gonna ask you for your name. Your name will come up on the screen. So if you don't want your name to be here, don't type it in. Um, don't put like a racial slur or anything because that's pretty lame. 
Not to be a nag, but when are we getting merch? Very soon, actually, because I thought I needed to form an LLC, but I don't. So I'm supposed to talk to Fraz sometime this week because I'm just going to copy everything that she did. Sorry. I, uh, this should have happened a long time ago. This was a lot harder and more complicated than I expected. And it hasn't even launched, so I'm sure it'll just get harder and more complicated. But that's fine because I'm really excited about it. Slay girl boss. Love that for us. All right, I'm going to give people a couple more minutes to join. While people are joining, let's talk about, actually, I'll wait till we're done, and then we'll talk about Titanic so that we can actually focus. Okay, I'm going to give you a couple more seconds to join. I'm going to count down from 10. Let me put the link in the chat one more time and count down from 10. All right, the code is A J N T G. All righty, you have 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. And last time, the code is A J N T G. If you have not joined, it will let you join late, and the code is at the top of my screen. You can see it right up there. Boom, I'm hitting start. What did we learn about today? Do you think the people are alive on the submarine? No idea. Could not tell you. Why is it stuck on zero? It's giving me anxiety. There we go. We learned about Firefest today. This music makes me feel like I'm in the Sandals parking lot. Imagine being at the Sandals Resort during this time. I want to interview someone who was just at the Sandals Resort either to enjoy the sailing or just because they wanted to go to the Sandals Resort who just saw all of this happening. Like, imagine being on your balcony and seeing all these people run around like little cockroaches. What was Billy's pre-fire business venture? Love the island vibe. Do you guys like the beach one? I also, while people are playing the game, I just want to say thank you to all of the lovely individuals that donated via Venmo. We are already at, so when we started this stream, we had raised $153, and now we have raised $270. So thank you very, very much to everyone that has donated. Um, I am hoping to hopefully raise the money, like roughly maybe by the end of this summer, to get a new computer. So I'm very excited about that possibility, and I'm moving into a new place, and I'm going to have an office It'll really be the same to y'all because it's just a realm, but I'm excited to have a new office set up and I'm going to get, I'll just continue to talk about my home decor. So I want to make my office like if there was an office in the Barbie dream house and I'm kind of starting with a blank slate. It's gray walls and gray carpet, which is very depressing. So I want to get like a white fluffy rug for the whole room. Um, and then I want to do like a hot pink glitter wall, but just on one of the walls. And then I'm going to get, I'm going to get rid of this desk and instead I'm going to get a bar height kitchen table. So it's a bigger square so I can kind of have my stuff further back and then still have like my drinks and my little snacks set up and all that. Um, and then I'm going to get like a, like club chair, but like the tall, so cause I can sit crisscross. I don't really like this chair that much. So yeah, I'm very, very excited about it. Oh, Childish Gambino's left sock. Can someone donate to a poor black woman that can't afford rent? Me, LOL. What's your Venmo or Cash App? Let's put it in the chat. What's your Venmo? What's your Venmo, Queen? Kind of new here. We'll be tuning in religiously. And again, next week we'll be here on Tuesday instead of Wednesday. DBS Treats is my Venmo. I'm going to pin that. I don't really know how pinning works. Um, manually unpin at the end of stream. Perfect. There it is. So go ahead. Venmo child just Gambino's left sock. If you were planning on Venmoing me for a new computer, we raised enough money for tonight. Go send some money to uh, this lovely woman for her rent. 
We hate rent. We hate rent. I watched the dropout last week. Amanda Seyfried did such a good job. It really, she did. I fucking loved the dropout. My God, took a chance and it worked. <laughs> Always take a chance. I respect the hustle. Um, why did Firefest get kicked off the island? Because he said it was owned by Pablo Escobar, which they explicitly told him to not say that. What resort was near the actual festival grounds? Oh my god, I'm so happy people are donating so I can get a new computer. That's going to be dope. Dun, 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 dun. I thought it was really Pablo Escobar's island. It was not. It was a guy named Carlos who was like one below Pablo Escobar. Like he was a high up guy, but he wasn't Pablo Escobar. I showed my husband your video about the Titanic submersive and he was like, well, she's not wrong. I'm excited to talk about Titanic. Once this game's over, we're talking about Titanic for a couple minutes. They had festival assurance. Is that true or false? It's okay. You used the wrong your. We've all been there. He was the assistant manager of the drug ring. Yes, exactly. I have more TikTok followers than Billy McFarland. That's cool. Love that for me. His TikTok is so weird. Very odd. Who has been to the Titanic Museum in Branson? <laughs> I want to go. I want to tell you guys about my dream meetup. So my dream meetup is for us to go to a Chili's and we have it from like five to 10. And John Gosselin is the DJ. John Gosselin's DJing for us. And for the first couple hours, we're just having margaritas. And then I want to have everybody have like Barbie dolls and then I'll bring a bunch of craft supplies and we can all make little outfits for our Barbie dolls so that like they look like bad bitches while we look like bad bitches. So like I'll have Barbie doll clothes so that we're not like sewing, but like you can embellish, you can add on little decals, stuff like that. So that's what we're going to be doing at Chili's. And then we'll have like two hours to play with Barbies and we'll have like the Barbie fashion show and all that. And then it's just going to be like a chili charcuterie board. I don't want us to have like a sit down meal. I think that's a very awkward. I think grazing is more fun. So we'll have like lots of booths and all that. Oh my God, stop getting my notifications about the popsicles. Um, and then, yeah, we'll all have chilies and have our little, like, giant triple dipper of everything. That's going to be my meetup that one day I'll hopefully do. I have no legitimate plans for that. That's kind of in, like, a fire festival stage right now. Uh, but that's the vision for me. So, date. I'm working on it. I'm not actually working on it at all. But I think that that would be fun. This kind of sounds like a challenge on Drag Race, but with more snacks. I would buy a plane ticket for this. That's what I'm hoping. I'll have to do it in like a major city. I have a big following in the Midwest. Maybe I'd do like in the South. So maybe like Chicago or Atlanta or like Austin, somewhere like that. Will the Chili's be in the Bahama? It's at the Chili's in Puerto Rico. <laughs> Just kidding. At least you're honest about its conception. Like it's right now it's planned up here. That's the only place it's planned. You can just do it at my house. <laughs> so what are we learning next week? So I was actually originally, my plan was to do Andrew Tate for next week, but I started working on it and I just like literally couldn't stomach it. Like he's just so fucking vile and the things he's done were so fucking awful that I was like, I just can't. I cannot look at his face because it takes me like three, four hours to make this like presentation for y'all. So I was like, I cannot learn about Andrew Tate for that long. And Chrisley's is on my list. But the problem is I'm moving this week and Chrisley's is going to take like a long time because it's very complicated and they did so much illegal shit. So I was like, let me do Anna Delvey because there's like a lot of timelines about her. It'll be faster to make this stuff as opposed to Chrisley's. Like Chrisley's, I'm going to have to take the week off work. Like Chrisley's, that's all we're doing that week is Chrisley's. 
The handle deserved the win. Good work, a sandals parking lot. Oh my God, in first place, we have a sandals parking lot. Absolutely, you deserve the win. Then we have customs officer, not Pablo's Island, K, United Orca Union, Paige, Nicole, Firestarter, Ken, Lemon, the bomb.com, y'all, Firefly, Ash, PP Mattress for Fire, and an IRS parking lot. I will scroll through the rest. Nice job. We see Billy McFarland's carrot, a shitty cheese sandwich, Ja Rule's notes app apology, a gravel parking lot, abandoned sandals parking lot, Baja Blasted, gas station roller, good to see you, lots of cheese sandwiches, Firefest parking lot, breadstick with the Bahamian flag, that guy Andy was gonna suck off, the lone porta potty, a Zaxby's parking lot. I love when the letter or the numbers cut it off because I'm like, we're literally exceeding what Nearpod can handle, which I love for us. All right. Nice job. Nice job. We have lots of people on here today, which is very fun and very, very awesome. So, <clears throat> all right. So let's discuss the Titanic submarine. Let's talk about it. So memes, questions, jokes, or Titanic submarine. I'm going to dedicate a few minutes of my life to talking about the Titanic submarine with you all, which is great because I ate before I streamed, so I'm like not dying right now. Um, so let's talk about it. Let's discuss the stepson. So my thing is, that's not your fucking dad. So like, go to Blink-182. Like literally, who gives a shit? Oh, your username on Nearpod was Jello Shot? Stop. So, one, the stepson, I would have done the same thing. Go to Blink 182. Two, did you all know that this is being controlled with a terrifying to think about dying that way? Uh, you're going to have to take one for the team. I do not feel bad for those people. Do you think they offed the CEO? I want to find the video about the Titanic. Submarine. Video game controller. There's a specific video I want to find. Is this it? Common thread between Firefest and the Titanic sub. Blink 182. Thank you for bringing that up. I meant to say that earlier and I forgot. Why is this fucking video? I'm determined to find it. So if you did not know, they are controlling this with a quite literal Logitech game controller. I've not previewed this video. Can you fucking load? You have one job. That's to be a computer. Oh my god. Please support our journalism by enabling ads. Oh my god. Okay. Now there's going to be like 900 fucking ads and the internet's unreadable because the banner is going to pop up. Could you load any fucking slower? I mean, Jesus. This video better be perfect for how much we're going through for this. search crews racing against time to find that missing submersible after the U.S. Coast Guard confirmed overnight that underwater noises have been detected mm. in the area. The sonar buoys that found the noise is part of a massive search effort that would face a challenging rescue. Very few vessels and instruments are able to work at such extreme ocean depths. The Titanic sits 13,000 feet under the sea. That's more than nine times the length of the Empire State Building. Only a small group of people have ventured that far. It's part of the reason why Ocean Gate Exploration pitches passengers a once-in-a-lifetime experience for the price of $250,000. An eight-day journey from Newfoundland to the Titanic wreck site, about 900 miles off the coast of Cape Cod. Ocean Gate CEO the fact that it's called Ocean Gate. One of those on board the Titan now told NBC in 2022 passengers have to do more than pay a steep fee. This is a real expedition. We have you know all kinds of challenges. Former passengers say you have to sign a massive waiver that right up front says the trip can result in death. Once Perfect. passengers board the support ship, Ocean Gate provides a vessel orientation and safety briefing. Roger, platform ready to dive. The submersible's controls are quite basic. You run the whole thing with this game controller. The vessel detaches Incredible. and starts to submerge. You feel somewhat like you're on a totally different planet as you descend. It takes about two and a half hours to travel over two miles deep under the sea. No. Passengers describe the vessel as cold, with only one porthole to allow passengers to look outside. 
at just over 22 feet long and 8.3 feet high. This photo shows the seating configuration in practice. Passengers on the floor barefoot. They sit crisscross. What if nature calls on the roughly 10 hour mission? There is a small bathroom with a privacy curtain. And Ocean Gate says they turn the music up loud. The up close and personal view of the Titanic wreckage can last four or five hours. Passengers who have reached these depths, an exclusive club. More people have gone into space. This is going this not the video the I wanted. Is actually technologically harder to engineer. This incident is causing the broader tourism industry and especially extreme tourism to be looked at under a, a closed microscope to say, are we doing everything we can? Are we minimizing risk? And Crystal, what do we know about emergency procedures on board? Right, Janelle, well, former passengers tell us that they're taught to use this mid fuel system where they're able to drop weight and that would bring the vessel to the surface. There's also supposed to be what's called a necklace system that automatically corrodes after about 24 hours in the water and that also would bring the submersible up unless it's trapped beneath something. So still a lot of possibilities as they try and zero in on that banging guys. That's a challenge. Mark Kristen, thank you. So everything is a huge shit show basically. Um, the stepson would have gone to Firefest. So yeah, a couple things. One, there can I really there's one specific video that I really want to fucking find for you. Marine. And I think a lot of you know which video I'm talking about. Improvised. Twelve hours. Okay, I don't know if this is it. She's been saving up to see the Titanic for thirty years. Dreams don't have a price. Some people want a Ferrari. Some people buy a house. I want to go to Titanic. But the star of the show is the Titan, Stockton Rush's custom-built submersible, five-inch thick carbon fiber, capped on each end by a dome of titanium. If so all went well, I myself would be spending about 12 hours sealed inside on a dive to the Titanic. Not gonna lie, so I was a little nervous. They can only bolt it from the outside. A vessel that has not been approved or certified by any regulatory body and could result in physical injury, disability, emotional trauma, or death. Where do I sign? Oh, -ho! take your shoes off, that's customary. Okay. This is more what I wanted. Wow. Inside. Can you even see this? The sub okay. has about as much room as a minivan. So this is not your grandfather's submersible. <laughs> we only have one button. My grandfather would never do this. Should be like an elevator. You know, they have one button. Take a lot of skill. You the should. Is the only it is such a red flag that they're telling you you can go two and a half miles underwater with one button like an elevator. I don't know science, but I know that that's wrong. I have person sub in the world that can reach Titanic depths, two point four miles below the sea. It's also the only one with a toilet, sort of. And yet, I couldn't help noticing how many pieces of this sub. This is what I wanted. Improvised. We can use these off-the-shelf components. I got these from uh, Camper World. Camper World. We run the whole thing with this game controller. <laughs> Come on! It seems like this submersible has some elements of MacGyver and Jerry Rigness. I mean, you're putting construction pipes as ballast. I don't know if I'd use that description of it, um, but there's certain things that you want to be uh, buttoned down. So the pressure vessel is not MacGyver at all, because that's where we work with Boeing and NASA and the University of Washington. Everything else can fail. Your I think he did make go, it Your himself. lights can go. You're still going to be safe. But when expedition manager apparently Carl not studied the forecast for our Titanic dive, he concluded that the waves would be too big to launch the sub. We're looking at so this fucking guy, inches of his life, thankfully the weather guy was like, yeah, you can't go, the water's too rough, so he didn't go. And it bumps up a little bit. Our Titanic adventure would have to wait. But Stockton Rush offered our CBS crew a oh, consolation dive to the continental shelf 80 miles away. Apparently there's a lot of sheer cliffs underwater to see, shark breeding ground. They say it's really cool. The crew closes the hatch from the outside with 17 bolts. Immediately no. There's no other way out. Immediately Here's no. Here's how the launch is supposed to go. The sub is attached to a huge floating platform. 
motorboats drag it down the big orange ramp into the sea. I'm so scared. The aircraft found it prepared the platform for the next phase, which is the sinking. The platform submerges to around 30 feet, where the water is much calmer than on the surface. We are in the water, people. I'm terrified. Divers detach the sub from the platform. Oh my god. And away you go. I'm gonna throw up. I can't do this. There's no way to open it from the inside. And what happened next? You won't be disappointed, as we'll show you a little later on Sunday morning. Are they going to show it? Okay, well, anyway, we don't really care about this guy's weird little continental shelf tour. We care about the Titanic submarine. Um, I'm so, like, mortified and terrified of this entire situation, if we're being honest. Like, I'm actually going to throw up. Um, you can't just disappear out of people's lives. Me, <laughs> me when I found out the people on the missing Titanic submarine were billionaires. <laughs> oh, no, not the orcas. It wasn't an iceberg, that's all I'll say. Titanic tourist submarine has gone missing. It has held up to five people, and it was $250,000 per person. Um, they are allegedly going to run out of oxygen Thursday morning. I heard 5 a.m. I also heard 7 a.m. I don't know what time zones those are, so I guess that would be why they were different. But they're going to run out of oxygen tomorrow morning, and the part that scares me the worst is, let's say they found a way to come up to the surface, they can't get out because you can only open it from the outside. So even if they get out from underneath the water, they're just going to be bobbing there, which is, I don't like that. Um, how did they just lose them? So another great point. Um, you would think that they had like GPS and like all of this great technology. What they were doing is they have a text message system. So the driver would get a text from up above that would be like, go left, go right. And he would have his little video game controller and would just go. Um, but they lost contact with the vessel. So they think maybe the power went out or something happened. I don't know how texting works when you're underwater. GPS doesn't work underwater. I don't know how any of this works, but it seems to me that texting in a video game controller is probably not like standard. Um, so that's why we don't know where they are. And they're not attached to anything. So you can't just pull them up because they're not attached to anything. Because apparently submarines, you can't do that because the currents, it would like drag it. Like apparently you cannot do a tether. Apparently that doesn't work. I don't know. And the other layer is that we don't, we don't have other submarines that go this deep. So like the footage we have from Titanic, that's from when we sent robots down there. We've never sent people down there because it's so deep. So even if hypothetically they find them, they don't really know how they'd be able to get them because it's not like you can just dive down there and get them. Like, you can't just be like, oh, there they are, and like pick them up. Like, it, like I would think you could have some kind of like, like metal, like claw hand, like at, you know, the arcade, like you could just, whoop, but that's not how it works. You can't do that apparently. Um, so that's really not good that that's the situation for them. The other thing that's really not good, I forgot what I was going to say, but yeah, the whole thing is really not good. Let's see what more people are talking about. Um, the memes about this guy. Keep my family in your prayers. So they had one window, one window had to be bolted and homie brought his 19 year old son down there. Apparently they also told them to bring a sandwiches and bags. I don't know if that's true. Someone on TikTok said that. Common thread between fire Festival and submarine. Rich people paying out the booty for cheaply made and poorly planned experiences. Yep. I'm enjoying all the air around me as a poor. It's a Logitech controller, so it's not even a name brand controller. That same sub that was missing is now flagged as a whistleblower as being unsafe. There's a whole lawsuit about it. Yeah, so apparently a bunch of, like, people that know things, like engineers and stuff, they wrote a letter a long time ago being like, please do not do this. This is very unsafe. Don't do this. 
They had to restrict their diets so they didn't poop or pee as much. It's just an immediately no. My last two brain cells trying to find a way to make money. That is very funny. Um, death caused by affluence. Me getting upset and throwing the controller. Everyone else on the sub. The quality assurance guy remembering he didn't do his job. Oh my god. Imagine paying $250,000 to explore the wreckage of the Titanic and I pull out this bad boy to control our sub. I read the submarine doesn't even have an actual window, just a screen. So apparently there's one small window, so that's how they're looking at stuff. And there's like a screen, so it's like a camera and the window, I guess. I don't really know. Oh, this is what I was going to tell you. One theory that I read that I makes a lot of sense to me is that they were inside of the Titanic. And that's when they lost communication. And so they can't figure out how to get out because it's like dark and shit and they don't have directions. So I bet they're like stuck in the dining room or something. Um, whole thing is very, very horrifying. I'm on the bottom of the world. Oh my God. <laughs> bang, bang, bang. The water is safe. Send more billionaires. Bang, bang, bang. Made 250k to ride in this. Documentary if they're dead. Documentary if they're found. Emoji movie in case they discover the horse. Oh my god. Tell the rich I want them to know it was me. I don't think it was the orcas because the orcas don't go down that far. Um... I went on a date yesterday and the guy said, nah, lots of things use game controls to control them. You'd be surprised. And I was like, uh, fuck this. And that was the moment I checked out. I'm sure that's true, but like probably not submarines. Maybe like toy drones. I don't know. The orcas after finding that submarine. Five guys really hit the spot. OMG, I'm so full right now. Oh my god. The people missing on the Titanic submarine when they wake up tomorrow. Oh my god. Tonight was very, very fun though. I'm glad that we talked about the Titanic submarine for a while. I'm going to go ahead and turn TikTok off because I always forget to. And for those of you on Twitch, thank you so much for being here. Um, we are here normally on Wednesdays, but this upcoming week it will be Tuesday. So this upcoming week we are talking about Anna Delvey. Let me get that slide back. My computer will work. So next week we'll be talking about Anna Delvey. <clears throat> and we will be here on Tuesday. Thank you so much for being here. Have a great night. Peace, love, and blessings. I will see you on